Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, people on the Pacific side. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the keynote, uh, the, uh, the talk, uh, which will be given now for the triplet by Dr. Uh, Raja. He's uh, uh, the senior fellow in AMD and uh, packaging uh, team. He was uh, being uh, before <clears throat> uh, in uh, Intel, principal engineers after Intel, he moved to Apple, and finally he is landing now in uh, uh, AMD, leading uh, the packaging technology uh, and uh, architectures and technology and production uh, team. Uh, Raja, he's uh, uh, graduated from Carnegie Mellon University in 2005, <clears throat> and uh, before that, he finished from IIT uh, Madras uh, in 2000. We, uh, he's one of the key active from the beginning of the uh, also packaging uh, technical work group uh, since he was in Intel and he come with even one of the nice definition which 2.3 and uh, start 2.1 and come with a very interesting one here. Uh, to bring uh, different definitions of the packaging and try to see how we can classify it here. So today he will be give us an overview about chiplet uh, and how we see how he sees the world from GPU side and CPU side uh, by, uh, in his new uh, perspective in EMD. Raja, please go ahead. All right. Hey, thanks for the the introduction, Kamal, and thanks to IEEE HR committee to uh, sort of invite me to this invite me to this discussion. I'm really happy to be here. I've been here a couple of years back uh, discussing the 2D, 3D topics, and hopefully uh, we will continue uh, in the future as well. So today uh, I'll be talking about uh, how do we, from a product standpoint, architect triplet solutions for high volume solutions. And there's a presentation that we have pulled together between myself and uh, Sam Nassinger. Sam Nassinger is a, is a senior VP and a corporate fellow. Uh, he's been uh, a late, late innovator on yeah, many of uh, AMD's power, power advancement or efficiency techniques and architectures. And he has a pretty significant uh, industry experience in this field. And uh, Gamal just gave, gave a brief overview of my background. So we are the co-authors. What we'll discuss today is what are the trends and forces behind chiplets architectures? Uh, how does AMD view uh, chiplet benefits, uh, which is for most purposes, how the industry views it as well. And we'll talk about some specific case studies of AMD products on what are the design challenges associated with chiplet integration and how we solve these problems. And we'll, we'll really leave it up uh, from a future direction standpoint on what are the things that you're thinking about, what is industry thinking about, and what are the, the challenges for those future directions. This chart just shows the uh, CPU and GPU performance trends as a function of uh, the last decade or so. What has been pretty evident uh, is significant increases in performance for both CPU and GPU performance. The GPU performance in the left graph as noted by a single position point floating point operations per second. And the uh, CPU performance noted as a second uh, two piece over performance. Pretty much what you can see is like two, two and a half uh, uh, 2x increases every two years, which is really uh, exponential performance increases, which has really been fed by Moore's law over the last uh, two decades or so. But as you're all aware, Moore's law is slowing down and the trajectory with which the improvements had happened over the last two decades is starting to slow down, especially when we start hitting the 14, 10, 7, 5 and beyond while the cost continue to increase. So what we have plotted here is uh, the normalized die cost per yielded millimeter square. And uh, what is increasing die challenges for 250 millimeter square, for example, is essentially also shooting up exponentially uh, as a function of uh, node, which puts a lot of pressure on uh, the gross margins of, a, of, of any company. And what is also happening is to feed these GPU and CPU increases as a function of time, we are also, uh, we have to add more features to the die, which increases the die size. And we are hitting reticle limits already. And this has really 
pretty much unsustainable because we can grow the reticles a little bit here and there um, and it requires a lot of fab changes, but intrinsically uh, we are coming at a point where it's pretty unsustainable to keep on increasing die cycles. So as a company, uh, AMD has actually uh, invested a lot in uh, going into chiplet architectures to significantly extend performance gains. And the rest of the talk will uh, describe some of the key innovations we have done um, along these lines. So one sim a simple question that you may ask is, uh, hey, if technology scaling can give you only one and a half times more devices every two years, why not just make the chips approximately 1.33x bigger to get two x transistors? And the question, and the answer lies in the yield, of course. So what we have shown is like a, uh, from a research uh, article, uh, the reference is shown below. If you have um, 395 chips and we get what 3362 good diet, 8% yield loss, for the same effective defect density, we would actually get a 16% yield loss if the die becomes larger and essentially 2x larger, 395 becoming 192, but I'd also get a 16% yield loss, which is also not sustainable, right? Uh, uh, hitting the reticle limits. So that sort of motivated the whole chiplet architecture and how do we build multiple smaller chips. So in the first generation, the thought is, hey, if I have a monolithic die with, let's say the 2X uh, functionality, can I split it into two dies with uh, X plus X functionality? And then over a function of time, can this X plus X, the, a single X, can it actually now start packing 2X more density? And historically it was not needed for most markets uh, except for high performance computing. Moore's law was sufficient to meet compute, compute needs, but especially in the high performance computing and even now in the lower performance computing needs, um, uh, Moore's law is not scaling fast enough. So chiplets are starting to permeate into much more of a uh, larger uh, span than just high performance computing. But the fact of the matter of chiplets is once you want two chiplets to actually start behaving like monolithic does, you need to add significant uh, uh, overhead, so to speak, on chiplets to start uh, communicating like a monolithic type. Uh, now the two chiplets have to have extreme bandwidth to really function as a monolithic silicon. So we add additional interfaces to increase the bandwidth and additional area for replicated logic on both sides of the silicon to be able to make the communication seamless. Simple things like memory controllers, for example, that needs to go on both devices which essentially leads to uh, higher packaging costs, additional design effort, complexity, as well as uh, uh, DFT methodologies. So the 2X device functionality typically costs more than a 2X silicon area, effectively. Of course, the yields are gonna be better, but the, it, it's not free. So. And advanced packaging has actually played a significant role over the last 15 years or so, uh, uh, het heterogeneous integration, MCMs, MCPs, uh, SIPs are all in vogue uh, in the last five, 10 years. But this is not a new concept. Uh, as, as early as uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, IBM had the ceramic substrate MCMs uh, shown on the left of the picture. And Intel and AMD have been doing uh, multi-chip packages for more than a decade, uh, at least since I started my career, it's, it's, it's happened. So it's not new fundamentally, but what is new though is uh, right now we are at, at a point where Moore's Law is ending and advanced packaging has really has to pick up the slack of Moore's Law to really drive the next generation of technologies. It was never that advanced packaging was not there, it's just now it's becoming more and more prominent in how we start interconnecting different uh, pieces of silicon to drive different architectures. So instead of uh, having, let's say, um, so many of these dyes coming out of way for tested assembly, we get only six of the functional SOCs. If I break it up into, let's say, um, four X pieces, even with, sorry, even with the same defect density, I can, I can get much more functional SOCs. That is the whole premise of, uh, of chiplet architectures. So let's go into some um, uh, deep dive into uh, AMD Epic Server Processors as a case study in terms of how we architecture our chiplets. So from a, for our first generation uh, Epic architecture, um, when we, before we had like a traditional monolithic die that's shown in the picture on the left here, we had a 32 core die, uh, CCX is our 
uh, reference for a core complex device, CCX or CCD. The, on a monolithic die, we had the different IO functionalities as well as DDR connecting to the external memory. And we also had uh, what we called infinity fabric that communicated socket to socket. As a baseline, let's say this was at one, one X cost. When we moved into our first generation Epic series of products, we are able to deliver the same functionality 32X die cost by splitting the die into four pieces, right? At uh, roughly uh, half the cap cost. So of course it enables significantly higher yield, uh, uh, increased feature sets, and you can essentially now start using this into multiple products. I can take, let's say two of these cores and populate on a lower end segment, uh, and then essentially start building a sort of a scalable platform. So, uh, but the, the caveat as, as I noted earlier was when we had our monolithic design, it was at 777 millimeter square approximately, but moving into this uh, triplet architecture, even though the individual dive are only 213 millimeter square, let's, let's say three X smaller, the effective area was now 852 millimeter square because of all the additional overhead. And what we see here is we had to add duplicated logic we add the infinity fabric in multiple locations to now do the die to die communications as well as the files associated with it. So there's almost 10% of an MCM area overhead. So now that we did that first disaggregation, what do we do for an encore? Uh, we had to move to seven nanometer because of the performance benefits. Uh, the chart on the right shows the seven nanometer compute uh, efficiency gains. We could get two X density greater than 1.25 X frequencies um, and half at, at, uh, or half the power of the same performance. But the problem was the cost per yielded millimeter square, the 250 millimeter square die, as I noted in the previous stage, was also significantly higher. It's two X higher, right? So, but the gen, the gen one architecture that we did that does not necessarily scale well, if you we had to double the core cons, if you had to go from 32 to 64 cores, you, you couldn't quite double it. So we had to come up with innovation to make this work. So how did we go about doing it? So if you look at the our original uh, Ryzen processor die uh, shown in the picture on the left, top left, or top right rather, we have the, uh, the Zen cores as well as L3 cache in the same die, along with the DDR and the Infinity Fabric as well as the other PCI links. If you look at this, the CPU core plus the cache, L3 cache comprised only about 56% of, of the area. And going into seven nanometer, all the other functionalities uh, saw only saw very limited gain going into seven nanometer, the remaining 44%. So what we really did in the space was, hey, now partition the SOC and reserving the leading edge silicon, in this case, seven nanometer, only for uh, the CPU and the L3 cache. So that core complex now or had down 86% had CPU as opposed to 56% on the previous time. And then we left the IO and the memory devices on an N minus one node. <clears throat> so our, that's how our second generation Epic architecture evolved into the, what we call the IOD or the IO die, which we stayed on 14 nanometers, but then moved the core complex dies into, into seven nanometer and also increase the number of core cons because of that. So the concept really here is use an advanced technology where it is absolutely needed and each IP now can be optimized, optimized on its very unique uh, technology nodes. And then we also invented the second generation infinity fabric for making the die to die communication more seamless. And one of the other uh, implications is when we move to the centralized IO die, we uh, significantly improve the NUMA performance per socket as well, uh, which led to significant CPU performance and power efficiencies. So how do we now connect the chiplets? So uh, silicon interposers, silicon bridges have been in vogue uh, for across many companies, but they provide significantly higher varied density than an organic package, no questions about it, but they have very limited reach. And the fact that they are highly resistive is not very practical for long reach solutions. So it only supports die edge connectivity, which limits the number of chiplets and core complexes that it can, can, can support. So the, the top picture essentially shows an illustration of uh, 
typically where uh, an interposer size would uh, necessarily limit us from scaling. And this black outline shows what a, a theoretical interposer construction would look like in terms of the reach that a silicon design can actually tolerate. Whereas an MCM approach is where we are using today is really looking at and scaling it on an organic package to actually double the core count. So our preferred approach was to retain the on package 30 slings for these direct connections. And I'll explain a little bit more about the methodologies we used. Now, uh, once we decided to go down this path, uh, uh, for on packet 30s, and this shows the example of the first generation Epic. What, what is happening is the infinity fabrics have to talk to each other within the package and all the DDR has to escape, how it has to come into the die. And there's a significant routing challenges that happened uh, uh, due to, to interconnect these triplets. And now going from four to nine, the routing challenges actually became even more complex, almost exponentially complex to deliver the same or better performance. So when we move to this scheme, scheme with IOD, um, there's a different kind of uh, uh, routing challenges. What we had to do now is, uh, this, uh, these are, this is where the power entry was on the north and south. We had the IOD die and we had the CCD also along the same sort of axis north to south, right? So we had to route this infinity fabric from the IOD to the two deepest chiplets. And we had to share these layers with off package studies and competing power delay requirements. The good thing about this was the DDR had a clean escape path on the east and west. One of the other uh, implications of doing this kind of an architecture was we could essentially take these Zen 2 CCDs and populate it into our, into our desktop platforms, effectively using the same CCDs and also cutting, let's say, uh, one quarter of the IO die and using it as a as, a, as an IO die for desktop. So it really enabled us to scale this, um, this platform all the way from server, highest end server to the lowest end desktop. And while we're at it, we did a lot of things in terms of the physical architecture of the interconnect itself, going to uh, copper colors, so enabling a common interface, um, and which enables uh, higher e uh, uh, IMAX capabilities and enabling a, a much uh, easier assembly solution. And the, the good thing about the scalable architecture was we could just keep the same memory um, and the IO die, but just go from Zen 2 to Zen 3 when we went into the fourth generation processors and essentially keep the socket footprint without disrupting the platform. So it really uh, enabled us to significantly gain uh, performance like up to 19% IPC increase on the products that we just launched without doing anything significantly different. Keep the same socket, keep the same IO die, just change the cores out. The uh, other challenge we had to uh, sort of, uh, I briefly mentioned earlier was this, uh, how do we improve memory performance? In server uh, architectures, memory latency is actually the, the most important factor in terms of defining performance. And the goal for our second generation Epic architecture was how do you improve on this uh, uh, from a CPU design performance? And uh, non-uniform memory access for folks that are familiar with this, uh, they are a result of memory interfaces being distributed across across the die, uh, especially when we are in our first generation design, the DDR was essentially distributed, the DDR and the memory controller were distributed across multiple die. So there was delay in terms of uh, uh, NUMA one, NUMA two sort of die communicating to each other in terms of how it impacted latency. So ideally we wanted to be less than like 50 nanoseconds, but on an average perf performance standpoint, because of all these, uh, uh, sort of uh, extra clocks and hops that we had to go through, our overall performance actually, uh, from a latency standpoint, went to 128 nanoseconds. This is where our second generation architecture improved on the memory latency by con consolidating all the um, memory uh, ecosystem into a centralized IOD die. And this significantly improved the memory latency by approximately 24 nanoseconds for 19% performance impact. And that's only now only minimal latency uh, for the different triplet architectures by going down this path. So from a performance uh, standpoint, uh, what, what you see here is for the same performance, if you had to go to um, from a, a, a compare a monolithic seven nanometer device versus a 
combination of seven and 40 nanometer chiplets, we're essentially able to get the die cost roughly, um, roughly half uh, by going to a chiplet architecture. And by doing multiple cores, we could actually scale across the platform going all the way from 16 cores to 64 cores without doing something significantly different from a die design standpoint or the package design standpoint for that matter, because we just had to depopulate die as and when needed. So higher core constant performance, significantly higher core constant performance are possible than with monolithic design and lower core costs at all core count uh, performance points than the full product product family. That is the beauty of this uh, architecture. And the cost of course scales down uh, by depopulating chiplets. And there's also a fixed cost of the IOD because I'm using the same 40 nanometer design. So for, for potential future directions, uh, some of the things that we are discussing, and this is also, I believe is true across the industry is also, how do we design for reuse and flexibility? Um, can we have our internal chiplet library, third party chiplets, and how do you also mix and match together on a common substrate? Um, and towards this, what are the right optimization points? Uh, do we need to be uh, use generic uh, interfaces like SERDES or PCIe, or should we do very optimal specific interfaces for some parts of the chiplet family in terms of interface widths, speeds, what are the protocols, what are the pinouts, and what are the memory options? So DDR versus HPM, which products use which kind of memory, what are the chiplet sizes, what are the power delivery implications? Because we still need to consolidate um, similar uh, philosophies for power delivery depending on the product uh, functionality, and what is the thermal budgeting allowance, and how do we actually do the scaling that I just noted in the previous page as well. Can I eventually get to uh, sort of a monolithic performance and a wafer scale system, uh, which uh, uh, Subuaya from uh, Caltech has also been, um, sorry, UCLA has also been uh, uh, investigating deeply how do you get to wafer scale systems for HPC performance. And then what is the right architectural partition? Uh, obviously there are multiple ways that we can partition. Uh, we chose a certain path for our uh, first generation and second generation EPIC programs. But I believe this is going to be a rich field in the next uh, five, five years to a decade in terms of people coming up with different mix and match strategies and how do we now start uh, using advanced packaging techniques, which could also be very different uh, to, to piece it together. The key to this, to this slide is uh, the fact is advanced packaging actually is is a lot more broader uh, than traditionally what Moore's law scaling used to give because it was just purely number of transistors per millimeter squared. But when you go to uh, sort of advanced packaging technologies, you have 2D architectures, you have 2.5D architectures, you have RDL based architectures, you have 3D architectures, and even within 3D, you have a whole range of architectures. Uh, there's a huge now, a new toolbox uh, that we can use to actually mix and match it in a much more uh, focused manner. I'll actually skip this in, in the interest of time. The other thing is when you're doing all these chiplets, uh, especially third party chiplets, what are the security protocols? Should advanced packaging interconnects now be uh, uh, security sensitive? How do you actually get around it? Not that we have a great answer for this yet, but these are things that as a community, we need to start thinking about a lot more. And what comes next, right? Um, really, how do you, I talked about how much this chiplet um, uh, connection overhead has, has uh, both on interposer designs and uh, and uh, end scheme designs. So what are the next generation dense interconnect challenges? So today, the 3D interconnect products that are out of the market are mostly memory focused. Uh, of course, uh, there are some companies also doing uh, memory stack on compute, compute and compute uh, architectures uh, like Intel's Foros, for example. Um, so those are those are all going to be starting to gain steam uh, as as we move forward with more and more disaggregation and heterogeneous architectures. One thing I do want to highlight here is uh, what I've shown here is uh, a TSV pitch uh, going from very coarse pitch to a fine pitch. At the coarsest pitch, we can do uh, stacking architectures like DRAM on CPU, CPU on CPU, like die to die communication. But when the pitch starts scaling down, it opens up a lot more options uh, in terms of how do we envision the architecture split or the um, 
that I just mentioned a couple of slides back. I can go to cores on cores, cores on uncore, almost at, a, at an IP, IP level stacking. Uh, going further, we can even do macro level stacking, even take IPs and split and fold them. And then eventually, I, uh, this is the goal where we really truly say chiplets can replace monolith silicon when you do circuit level slicing and connect them through uh, TSCs or hybrid bonded approaches. So this is really as a function of TSC pitch, there are various architectural options that are feasible. And when you start stacking DRAM um, in terms of where the, for example, EC skill lies in the hierarchy, um, whether the, the stack DRAM is a cache or a system memory, these are some considerations that we have to uh, keep in mind when we're talking about 3D stacking and its implications. Plus, when you're mixing and matching triplets, especially in a 3D con uh, stack configuration, how do we understand all the parametric variations? How do I mix and match? Should I mix and match slow and fast die? Should my product be all fast die, all slow die? Um, that impacts uh, our pre-stack binning as well as uh, frequency boosting performance. And what are the implications to clock distribution in terms of skew and jitter across different layers, depending on which bin we pick this from? So those are all considerations that go into defining uh, these architectures. Of course, non-good die testing. Um, this is a, is a presentation in itself. I think there are semi actually has a lot of workshops and I typically do it does too on non good testing. But of course, and especially in 3D stack construct, one faulty die could run the entire stack. So what are the redundancy, redundancies that we had to put in place? Um, um, how do we supply power to these stacks now? And what happens if um, there's not enough redundancy? Is there an incomplete functionality? Or if, uh, or if PLL clocking is now done on a different chip? Those are things that you have to keep in mind. Of course, uh, when you go to 3D, thermal stacking is obviously going to be the biggest challenge. I think it's 3D does increase power density. So uh, there needs to be a lot of work to creatively interleave cool and hot spots uh, within the die in terms of the floor planning standpoint. Uh, so almost have to design for thermals uh, with 3D. And the power management also becomes much more complicated. How do you deliver the power to the topmost die? Let us now go to the board substrate through the C4, through the TSCs. So there's a lot of parasitics involved in that construction. So, so in summary, I think uh, what I've highlighted is the silicon scaling is actually running into significant challenges and 2D chiplets are a path to keep things going in the short term. And there's obviously challenges with managing interconnect overhead, power and cost. But eventually when we get to 3D stacking, uh, it does reduce overhead while introducing significant a host of new challenges, binning, testing, thermals, power delivery and management. So the significant innovation that I anticipate uh, in the next, I mean, decade or more, even more than what uh, a silicon scaling can provide. So I think it's good time to be in advanced packaging. And I'd like to thank especially Gabe Lowe, uh, Sam, Kevin and Mahesh for their contributions and all the talented AMD design teams to make uh, for their epic engineering uh, achievements. That's it. Okay, so, so our next speaker, Bobby Vanakota, is a system architect with Broadcom. Prior to Broadcom, he worked at various companies and in also in academia. But he is today here not representing Broadcom. He is here today representing the Open Domain Specific Architecture Project, which is an active community that aims to define an open marketplace of interoperable chiplets. Now, HRR has been actively participating in that community. And uh, I have given talk there and uh, Dave Armstrong in the test a group I have also participating in that and also Bill Bottoms. So welcome, Papi, go ahead. Thanks for the kind introduction, Bill. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm always nervous at standing between an audience and lunch. So I will uh, try to get you through this as quickly as, I, as quickly and efficiently as I can. And uh, please feel free to stop me at any time. Um, 
And um, also I noticed uh, quite a few of my fellow conspirators are online attending this talk. So if any of you would like to chime in at any point, uh, please do so. Um, I am gonna be flipping through a lot of material here. Uh, I'm honored to follow this wonderful presentation from AMD. Uh, and uh, the idea here is I'd really like to, I'm here representing, as Bill said, uh, a pretty active community of, uh, a pretty active large com community. And I'd really like to give you a flavor of what the community has done. And my most important objective, uh, which paid off in spades last year, and which I'm very excited to be here this year, is to get more people in the audience to participate in the ODSA. Um, so really it is, uh, our group is a, um, the open domain specific architecture is a sub project in the open, com open uh, compute project. And really we sit at the intersection of two interesting trends. Uh, this idea that you want domain specific architectures for compute intensive workloads and that you can better design things using chiplets. And, uh, I, I'm lucky to follow this nice talk from Roger because he pretty much laid out everything there is to know about chiplets and why we're doing them. So I'm gonna do a faster forward into what we do as a group. So in terms of what we've done, I was here last year um, and uh, since then, you know, a bunch of nice things have happened. We've grown as a community. We've got about three new work streams. We've made really good progress on a POC. Uh, in fact, I, we, we'd like to build more, which is one of the big reasons I'm here to ask for help from the assembly packaging and test, test world. Uh, we have made great progress on a fully open physical and logical die-to-die -die interface. If, you'd have, if you noticed Raja's presentation, you'd, you'd see the infinity fabric. Really, when you communicate, when you connect chiplets, they also need to exchange information, not just be connected physically. And I think we, have what I'd say is the first fully open physical and logical data -data interface. And finally, we've sort of we've been really good about publishing what we've done as a group. Uh, we've got fa a fairly large number of uh, papers and conference papers to sort of share. Hopefully that will get a, uh, to force us to clarify our thinking and share what we're doing with the rest of the community. So I think uh, we've gone through this guy, basic idea of SOC dis disaggregation as a use case for chiplets. And the second use case that uh, drives some of the efforts in the group is this idea of package integration, which is this idea of taking what's on a board and gluing it together into one silicon package. Um, so these are the two, and each of them comes with uh, different, uh, different constraints. In the left, you're sort of saying, how do I reduce a form factor, et cetera. On the right, you're saying, how do I get better yields and or, uh, all, all, the, all the motivation that Raja just went through. Uh, but it, there's also an important logical difference. It turns out that the transaction protocols or the protocols you use to move data around are different in each of the two use cases. So uh, really when you look at a, when you look at our, both our use cases, obviously when you have a die to die phi, uh, what you want is a fairly low, uh, low, low power connectivity, low energy connectivity between the chiplets and one of the interesting things we early on decisions we made as an open group is that we really want to do work that applies to a wide range of packaging technologies um, across both uh, mon across both laminate and uh, interposer based advanced packaging technologies. And second thing, because of these uh, use cases, that we really wanted to find a way to support our transaction protocols for a wide range of use cases. So if you're going to shrink a board to a package, you need to look at PCIe, CXL, and C6. And if you were going to uh, look at disaggregating a die, uh, that you're gonna look at some form of a, um, AXI protocol or a proprietary bus protocol, the tile link to disaggregate a design. And really our activity as a group, we, the entire effort is aimed at sort of creating this idea of a chiplet marketplace where you can mix and match uh, mix and match chiplets from multiple vendors into one package. Today, for the most part, chiplet-based designs integrate, uh, integrate die from a, single, uh, from a single design house or internally or externally. And what the idea is that you, know, the OC, we, you, you really are gonna change what you integrate according to the form factor you're targeting. The OCP itself has quite a few modular form factors that you can target. Uh, there's a, a something called an OCP NIC 3.0 form factor. There's a, 
a bunch of uh, other interesting form factors. Our work as a group is a split into three broad categories. One is this idea of defining an open interface. Um, the second is to create uh, as best as we can as uh, uh, the reference designs, which are a starting point for new designs. And finally, the idea is that uh, the other thing we realized early on is that uh, really the workflow and what you do with uh, chiplets is going to be different from the monolithic workflow. So in terms of uh, defining best practices, in terms of defining information exchange, et cetera. So these are the three broad classes of activities we have as a group. This is the, I won't sort of dive into the big details of the stack, but really the sort of top level view is that we were thinking that the best way to do a marketplace is to give system designers protocols they're already familiar with. So in that sense, you want them to design, uh, you want them to build systems from chiplets in a marketplace using protocols that they already understand. In that case, it means they already understand PCIe, they already understand CXL, C6, or if you're looking on die, you're looking at Axie or Tile Link, right? So really the, the name of the game of the stack was, how do we take this class of evolving die to die files, which can be 30s files or uh, a, the AIB five from Intel, and how do you map transaction protocols? What middle logic or middle protocols do you introduce to map existing transport protocols onto, um, onto the uh, die to die files? So really as a group, the, what you see our work is concentrated on the green areas. We've introduced uh, two new open die to die files. And on top of that, we're introducing this idea of using abstraction layers, commonly agreed upon abstraction layers by which you can map uh, transaction protocols onto these die to die files. That's really been uh, the focus of our stack, of our uh, stack definition effort, right? So um, if, if you do all that, then the thinking is, look, if you can create a bunch of chiplets out in the marketplace, each of which supports the stack, you can now glue these together into designs of your choice on various form factors. So we have had uh, this line itself is about, uh, I, I didn't update this particular slide from, about, from a few months ago, we've had a fairly decent participation from across the semi ecosystem, both in terms of uh, semi vendors, IP providers, et cetera, and all the way to end users and system uh, uh, systems vendors. And, uh, Pre all of 19, we have this wonderful tradition of holding workshops every quarter. And I think uh, we're going to be back to holding our first workshop in a couple of weeks. And uh, I, before I close the talk, I will uh, end with information for on, uh, I'm hoping a bunch of people in the audience will also participate in our workshop. There's a bunch of people to thank on this. Um, or the, really, this is not a, this is not a small effort. We've had a whole bunch of participation from companies, uh, from companies big and small. Our activity as a, um, as a uh, community is split across about uh, eight work streams, or there's nine work streams now. And really each work stream tends to focus on a particular topic. So uh, the newest one, for example, is the end user work stream. And I'll, I'll say more about that. Uh, the work streams we've had for quite a while are um, the bunch of wires, uh, the chiplet design exchange is something that uh, many people in the audience may be interested in. And uh, I've got, I, I think David Rajkov is online and Jawad is online as well. So really the idea in the chiplet design exchange is, hey, if you're gluing together chiplets from marketplace that you need to exchange information between chiplet vendors and, and uh, product developers and between product developers and system developers. And the chiplet design exchange objective is to enable that view of information. The business work stream is really focused on how do business relationships and, and contracts, how will they change in the age of moving to a chiplet based design? Our, we have a, the bunch of wires work stream is uh, focused on uh, creating a new file which can work on both laminate and uh, uh, advanced packaging. And I'll say more about that in a bit. So if you'd like to participate in the uh, ODSA, this is sort of the nitty gritty uh, low, the, the, this is where sort of we have uh, detailed uh, technical discussions. 
And virtually every meeting except the open HBI meeting is open to, open to the public. Anybody can participate. Uh, we also meet weekly as a group on Fridays at 8 a.m. Pacific. Say for example, this Friday, uh, Bill is, as Bill said, he's come and talked about that. He's come and, he, he's come and uh, uh, presented at our meeting and we would uh, be happy to have anybody who's interested in meeting the group present on, fri on our uh, weekly Friday meetings. Uh, this Friday, for example, we're gonna be talking about storage, uh, accelerated computer, excuse me, uh, computational acceleration for storage applications using our POC. Um, so, sorry about that. Looks like I've had a build here. Um, so, we really had a fairly decent uh, uh, steady progress as a group. And I'll walk you through the in the rest of this talk about some of our recent results. So, one of the things, in fact, I just put these slides in after I heard Raja's uh, talk in the last five minutes. Um, one, of, one of the things we did early on as a group was uh, come up with a standard set of agreed upon metrics uh, to compare a whole bunch of die to die phi options. So we first did this in 2019, and then we did a revision in 2020. And you can find a talk on this by Shah Bardalan from IR Labs at um, the OCP Tech Summit that happened about uh, four months ago. And what we tried to do was come up with a, a set of metrics that uh, the industry could sort of align itself around. And uh, the interesting thing is we didn't come up with these. This is really, uh, it took a lot of negotiating and meeting, but it's essentially something that uh, a whole bunch of five vendors agreed to as a fairly set of, uh, fairly representative, representative set of metrics. And um, it really boiled down to sort of narrowing, this is, so for example, this is one of the things we tried to standardize on. When you talk about measuring the power of a five, what exactly are you measuring? When you're talking about specifying, uh, specifying the bandwidth of a die to die five, what is it that you're specifying? coming up on very precise definitions that um, all of us could agree to. And with this, we were able to sort of create a standard, uh, standard chart by which a, somebody, a new product designer or a, a, virtually anyone in the industry could compare a whole bunch of options as on um, for die to die files. So for example, in this list, you'll see, uh, you'll see this table comparing the AIB bus 2.0 version from Intel, OpenHBI from uh, which is one of our files, and a bunch of wires file, AQ Link from Marvell, uh, and uh, uh, the, the AX Link from Analog X, and can, the uh, Candu bus from uh, Candu, and XSR 30s from AlphaWave, etc. So this is a nice handy cheat sheet where which you can compare um, compare files from multiple vendors. Uh, this sheet is available to the public. This, this, this table is actually extracted from a much larger, uh, much larger um, uh, Excel spreadsheet, which has some embedded macros. I'd be happy to give anybody who asks, uh, who, who wants it, access to this uh, spreadsheet. Um, so then the other thing we've made a lot of progress on is this idea of what we call a bunch of wires phi. Um, so really the, the big thing, our big aim in this was to provide a single phi, which allowed designers to sort of gracefully trade off performance for design complexity. So if you had a, um, if, if you had a uh, very simple design, which didn't really require a lot of bandwidth, but benefited from disaggregation, then you could use the base phi. But if you wanted to invest, you could in, uh, develop a much more advanced phi. You could either invest in going to advanced packaging or you could invest in going to much better design per lane, but that fundamentally you'd have the same basic phi and the same basic control mechanisms and digital interface mechanisms um, across a wide range of designs. The reason I'm spending some time on this is basically our, one of our big projects uh, in this coming year is to kick off a bunch of wires prototype chip and if we could really use some help from the packaging and test community for this uh, prototype chip. So uh, our aim in all this is to sort of provide the first fully open stack. So if you follow this stack, our theory is you can get a bunch of interoperable uh, chiplets in, a, uh, in, the, in the marketplace. Uh, it, it, and uh, um, so for the, the two stacks we're pursuing 
Um, and every, one of the things about open source, you realize is everything takes longer than you want it to. Uh, but the two basic stacks we're pursuing are uh, either running chiplets which support PCIe-based transactions or chiplets which support Axie-based transactions. So essentially in the model on top that you see, the PCIe, the, the, uh, the, the, the chips in the, in the design on top, the PCIe controllers think they're talking over a PCIe 5, but in reality, they're exchanging PCI information over a die to die 5. So the, the, the die to die 5 pretends to be a PCIe 5 to the rest of the chip. And in the uh, design on the bottom, the die to die 5 makes the two chips look like they belong to the same Axie domain. Right? So the design on the bottom is based on a protocol that NXP has open source called Diport, which hel helps you packetize Axie transactions over a die to die phi. Uh, the, design of the, uh, the design on the top is basically uses the pipe adapter from Intel. So our the this goes back to the idea of choosing an abstraction layer by, by interacting with a PCI controller through the pipe adapter, a bow phi looks like a PCI phi to a PCI controller. So this part, I want to transition to where we need uh, your help as a group. Uh, we really would like to build a lot. One of the first things we built is a workflow POC, and I'll tell you uh, how we've done so far on that. The next thing we'd really like to do is to go to these die to die both test chips in, uh, in this year. And uh, I'd like to share some more details of our, about our plans on these test chips. So one of the first things we've done, uh, this day took a tremendous effort. It's not easy to build a design completely in the open, starting from scratch, led by an engineer from Cisco, um, a solid labor of love. What we wanted to do was give system designers an ability to explore SOC architectures that integrate components from different companies. So we kind of mimicked the basic design of a uh, the basic design of a modular chiplet based design by saying, hey, what if you had a board with three do with daughter cards that could be populated with components from different companies? So out the door, what we're doing is we have a NIC from Broadcom where we really use something called an OCP 3.0 NIC, which is a standard form factor adapted to this card. Uh, and we have these custom pitchlets, uh, we, we call them PCB pitchlet, chiplets or pitchlets. Um, from NXP and Lattice and integrated with SSDs from Samsung. Uh, the whole thing is integrated by a company called Tamant and it's going to be hosted on Supermicro. So the idea is that, hey, let's say uh, as this board gains steam, uh, we get a new company which says, well, I've got my own CPU. Well, great, build your own little uh, CPU picture and plug it in and you can reuse the rest of the components. Or I have a new accelerator, uh, use an accelerator for uh, use an accelerator instead of these slots a, into one of these slots. Or if you have an own SSD with some kind of computed SSD, uh, fit them into one of those M.2 slots. So the idea is that this becomes a reconfigurable platform which you can mix and match. We've had the POC back from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the factory and it's up and running. Uh, I, we unfortunately need one more spin to get things right, but we're pretty close. I think our next step is to build a software storage application, storage acceleration application. And the next thing we'd also like to do is to reuse this board as a, as a bring up vehicle for our uh, BO bunch of wires test chip, right? So what we'd like to, our big next big project, and I'm gonna spend a few minutes on this, is to get a bunch of wires uh, test chip fabricated. Um, and the idea behind this bunch of wires test chip is really we want to go off and uh, sort of build and establish an ecosystem around this. And we think that you know spreading information out in the open is the best way to establish the ecosystem. We want to give designers very accurate both performance information, uh, cost information, and also create some kind of a reusable infrastructure. So tester heads, uh, validation platforms, you, you name it. Um, as a community, we've sort of said, so what we've done is we've put out a call for proposals for, um, for uh, anybody interested in building a test chip to come and uh, collaborate with us. We'd like to get some aggregate funding from the community, from semi-vendors, from uh, 
from foundries, from end users, and then feed it to people who are interested in building a test chip and sharing information. So one of the things we're very open to is we're not necessarily interested just in open source designs. Our primary goal is we're looking for people who are interested in sharing information about what they built. So information about the performance, channel models, channel characterization, eye diagrams, you name it. So we really would like to make as much information about the bow available as possible to, uh, to the community as a whole. And if you also get reusable, uh, reusable bow files that are available uh, to the rest of the community, that will be even better. So what uh, we're, we're, sort of there, there, we're splitting the test chip into, up into about seven mini projects and where I think we could really use help is on two big things. One is there's sort of two varieties, two parts we can go down or maybe we go down two parts simultaneously. One is the idea of running a bow on a laminate package. And the second is um, running a bow design on advanced packaging with an interposer. For either of these, one of the things that we could really so if we were doing an interposer path, we would like a reference design that is open to the community so that anybody else starting a bow design can use that as a starting point. And if it's a package, ideally we think it would be great to have a reusable package. So that if anybody else comes along and does a new bow test chiplet in a new foundry or a new process node, they can reuse a bunch of what we have already. And the other thing where we think there's a lot of room for collaboration is in the idea of a tester head uh, Mark Hartner and, and uh, Teradyne, and we've been talking with him for a while about, hey, um, how do we test stuff using Bow? Is there any way to, um, e e you know, if we're building these test chiplets, can we build a tester head or something along those lines to make it much easier to share uh, test, a test infrastructure across chiplets that use the Bow interface? Um, on top of that, of, of course, we, we, you know, one of the most difficult challenges in an open source project is to actually find shareable lab space. Um, this is one of the key learnings from the POC we built. It is not easy to find lab space which other companies are willing to sort of give access to their uh, partners. So that, that, that's another place where we, we're always uh, looking for help. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions on any of these after in the question period. Um, and then one of the other big areas in which we've had a lot of progress as a group is in end user participation. So uh, uh, Dharmesh Jani from Facebook has assembled a end user group that integrates members from Microsoft, Alibaba and Google. And the idea is that um, they're trying to sort of feed us requirements so that we can, um, the community can deliver product that is more likely or more, uh, uh, more likely to better meet end user needs. So the, now we're sort of, you can see us sort of trying to close the circle, right? So we've got all these open stacks, we've got all these ideas. Now, how do we glue these together into products, test vehicles that actually meet end user requirements? And the, fir the first place where we've seen this happen is in the Bow test chip project, where we've had a lot of end user feedback uh, sort of directing us to, hey, can you build a Bow interface at this speed on these laminate choices? So we're able to sort of, they, it, it, you know, aggregating demand uh, is, is a good pointer to the community to sort of say, hey, look, there may be somebody on the other side who's interested in what you're building. So the next thing this end user interaction has led to is uh, last year we uh, built a, did a market survey of, uh, we commissioned a, the OCP commissioned a survey on the potential market for chiplets. And uh, really what we, are doing next is trying to do a workshop to build on this market survey, right? And clearly there's, a, there's gonna be an aggregate demand for market for chiplets uh, across the board. And uh, uh, what does it take to build chiplets products from a marketplace? So to do that, we are um, organizing, actually uh, uh, Ravi Agarwal from Facebook, who's hopefully online and uh, uh, Dharmesh and a whole bunch of other people are organizing a chiplet business workshop. So it's very easy to get caught in sort of the technology of chiplets. And really we're trying to make a deliberate effort in this workshop to focus on the business side of this. Let's say you're trying to assemble a uh, product from a marketplace. 
what is it? How do, how do you how do you take the traditional value chain? How does it get impacted when you're trying to assemble and integrate products from multiple vendors? Uh, obviously, this is a huge challenge. We've got uh, participants from a broad section of the uh, value chain. Uh, we are definitely interested in having you. If you'd like to be heard, uh, please ping uh, ping either me or uh, Ravi Agarwal or or DJ from Facebook. Um, really, we're we're centering this whole thing around the idea of panels, and uh, the idea being that a panel will promote a good interactive discussion. Um, so there's more information on virtually everything I have touched on in this um, in, in this talk. Uh, virtually, we have a wiki which is uh, rather flat, no hierarchy, but contains everything, all our workshops, etc. The uh, bunch of wires files available in the GitHub repo. Uh, we've got these other documents that you can ask for access. We've, as I said, we published a whole bunch of uh, technical papers, white papers, refereed conference and journal papers. I'd be happy to give you pointers to any of them if you're interested. Um, but again, for us, the biggest thing we can do is get more help. Uh, uh, help us in uh, help us in the POC. Help us in the test chip. Uh, and then if we can help you make uh, chiplets with uh, IP from the I, I, IP based on these standards, we'd love to help you. Um, but either way, we would, I, I think as a group, there's a great interest in working with anybody who is interested in joining the community. Okay, excellent. So what I'd like to suggest is first, if there's any questions for Raja, maybe we can have three or four questions specifically that, that uh, people want to ask Raja. And then, then uh, specifically people may want to ask Papi. Then maybe you can, we can open up and, uh, and have a uh, um, open discussion exchange. So Gamal, do you want to uh, start off with uh, maybe three or four questions in the chat then that's uh, sent for Raja? Uh, so from uh, waiver level packaging uh, has any roadmap? Uh, oh, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, the first uh, question which coming from Richard Raja. What are the specific uh, qualif uh, qualification challenge requirement for the integrated chiplet, given the fact that individual chiplet are fully qualified? Yeah, I think the, the simplest way to answer that is the individual chiplets are I would use the word sorted rather than qualified. So we sort the individual chiplets before putting them on a package. Uh, so none could die, it goes into the package. The key at a package level is how do you make sure that the die to die interconnect is performing uh, for what are, what we designed to and for our specification. That's where the, the challenge comes in in terms of high bandwidth, low latency, test, test structures, test uh, tools, methodologies to be able to validate those. Uh, again, with the same flow for this one about a non good die, uh, what is the standards? And also the integration, if I can add here. And uh, for example, if you have memories, if you have uh, HBM, how you make this kind of integration and define the non good die and also can be all of them being mixed in, this, in one process to be assembled? Uh, do you have in mind any minimum qualification need to be ensure uh, that the uh, system chip list uh, can be uh, have a good yield? I think as a starting point uh, with every uh, supplier or every foundry that we work with, there is a certain expectation of yield. yield. And obviously we get only known good die across the ecosystem, right? Like if it's a, a CPU chiplet or a memory die or some other chiplet, it, the starting point is known good. The question really is what would it take to architect the known goodness um, at the memory level, at the silicon level, which is what we have a lot of design tools and methodologies uh, to plan for redundancies in terms of power redundancy, IO redundancy, for example, HPM, uh, as you guys, most of you know, has a lot of redundant uh, features in them to be able to enable known goodness, especially when we scale from, let's say a four high device to an eight high device. So that's where I think uh, a lot of innovation is happening. And especially when you start going um, tighter and tighter pitches uh, from a testing standpoint to get in on good die, 
what are the implications of sacrificial pads? Because you can't test it, let's say uh, 35 micron pitch, for example. How do you define the sacrificial pads? What is the dye area impact? What is the link impact to put these sacrificial pads? Those are the uh, design challenges that we typically do on a daily day to day basis. Okay, this is good. Uh, I think I don't have uh, more here, but if I can ask you, how you see triplet with offshore and onshore, if you try to make it onshore here, what do you think is uh, the successful way to go with the triplet onshore? I don't know if I quite understand that question. Um, uh, onshore, like uh, to have everything being done in uh, North America or US, uh, rather than you try to have uh, uh, more uh, triplet assembly and manufacturing in, uh, outside the uh, US. I, I don't look at it that way. It's really a global ecosystem, to be honest with you. I don't look at it uh, US and non-US. Uh, it's really where we get the best uh, capabilities uh, is where we, we gravitate towards. Okay, thank you. Bill, uh, turn it back again to you. Okay, so, uh, um, so there's a question um, for Bobby. Yes, sir. Um, Architects sometimes want to delay whether to integrate third-party IP block or chipset or chips later in the design cycle, but have some common top-level pr protocol. What progress has ODSA made in identify a common transport? So, um, so the, the 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 way we're sort of working around that is we, we're, we're thinking that a Transport protocol is a very personal decision for an architect. There seems to be sort of system level design requirements that drive the choice of the transport protocol. Uh, the way we're helping them delay, we, it's a pretty good point that you know they want to delay making these design decisions is by choosing an abstraction layer uh, more than a protocol. So if we choose an abstraction layer that, uh, so in, in our case, I think as a community, we've settled on uh, the pipe abstraction layer, the our LPIF, from Intel, and we're creating a third one for the interface between transport protocols and the link layer. And our thinking is that if you can harmonize files and designs to support these abstraction layers, then you can delay the decision of, uh, uh, of uh, you can sort of say, you can remain confident that as long as your protocol supports that IP with your protocol supports that transaction layer, you should be able to integrate uh, whatever third party IP you want into the design. Uh, that, that, that's our, I think sort of the way AMD sort of centers everything around infinity fabric, is, but given that it's a private protocol, you know, how do we make public domain protocols to meet that requirement basically? Does that make Thank sense? You. So, um, so in HRR, the two chapters that has in-depth uh, chaplet discussions are the high performance computing uh, to chairs Canagos and uh, uh, also in co-design and uh, Jose is here. So I'd like to invite Kanad uh, to ask both Raja and Bobby uh, questions that you may have. Kanad, are you there? So yeah, Raja, I, we have a question for you. At one time, uh, I have seen uh, publications from AMD and presentations that talked about using active interposers. Is that still in consideration or is it off the table? If so, what are the reasons why active interposers or substrates are not being pursued? Hey, Kanat, uh, good to meet Hi, you again. How are you? Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, I think. Um, Everybody, every company is investigating active interposer. If you look at uh, Intel's Foros architecture, it is an active interposer. Um, we are evaluating every possible architecture, but we make product decisions based on uh, power performance targets. Nothing is off the table for future products. Okay, thanks. And, and for Bapi, the question is, you know, we'd love to have access to your slides because there are a couple of charts I would love to steal from your slides in our chapter with uh, proper acknowledgement. So I'll send you a chat message with my email address. Of course, okay. of course. Thank uh, you, absolutely. good to see you again. Thank you. Um, Dale, Becker, do you have any questions for, um, for Raja and Bapi? 
So Bill, my question uh, got answered very nicely during Bapi's talk. Uh, I generally you know, have been looking at the MPSOC area with the idea of marrying bit scores and fabrics. And I do have a high level question for, uh, for both, which is, you, know, you described this very much as kind of in compute domain or compute and communication. But today we did not get much discussion of flash and new memory integration. So could we get a few minutes of specific consideration of integration of compute communication and memory for kind of miniaturized server or heterogeneous distributed system type approach? If anybody uh, among the speakers has anything to say on that. Please. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, when you say integrated memory, I mean, we do, we, we have le different levels of memory in our, in our silicon design already, L1, L2, L3. So those are memory by definition. So we integrate them into the SOC itself. Uh, and of course, the off-package off memories are DDR and LPDDR and um, HPM is something that we have integrated, integrated into our product families. So that's pretty common too. So, and we are exploring other new memory technologies as well. So I think there's active research that is happening across the industry on this. Sure, thanks. Um, Bobby, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's funny you should ask. It's a, you know, this is one of the uh, topics on which uh, we've been trying to desperately assemble a, a panel for a, one of our Friday meetings. And this seems to be split into two subtopics. One is, do you design a computer architecture to be centered around memory, which seems to be sort of a really forward-looking thing. And the other is a sort of more everyday thing of, okay, if I want to integrate memory as chiplets, uh, you know, if I take static RAM or non-volatile non RAM, what kind of interface will they take and what, the pro what protocol would you use on them? And the second one is, if I want to aggregate access to external memory through a chiplet, what would that look like? Um, I think there's been some progress on the la latter because there's, there's been some consolidation of, there, there's been some ideas floated on uh, uh, dead, uh, external uh, CS CSRD's memory interfaces. On the internal one, we're trying to get an, a discussion organized and uh, uh, you know, I'll be happy to let you know when, we, when that happens, um, but we'd like to assemble people from uh, Samsung and Micron and uh, uh, Micron and anybody else who makes uh, uh, memories to sort of go up, spawn a good discussion on this topic. Definitely. Thank, thank you, Bhatti. Um, uh, Bill, I have a question to Raja here. Do you mind if I can, or you would like to? Go ahead. Go ahead yeah, uh, because it's been bumped twice. So they try to ask you, Raj, about the laminate substrate. Do you feel that any concern to be used with the shiplet? And if there is no concern or it is a moderate concern, how you see the chip list increase count of layers and package size can be impacting that. Yeah, I, I actually saw that uh, question from Jan pop up. So, <laughs> hey, hey, Jan. Um, yeah, so. I'm not sure she uh, intends something. I, I know you. She, <laughs> okay, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I think I mentioned in my uh, in my presentation. So with the with the increasing use of chiplets, and if we stay stay with let's say an unpacked thirty uh, kind of interface. Uh, the, the routing actually becomes significantly challenged, uh, both for delivering power into the uh, our IO diode chiplets, uh, as well as uh, getting the IOs extracted out or making the interchip communications feasible. So it does put a lot of pressure on an, uh, on the laminate substrate, of course, in terms of layer count. And Jan knows very well, and uh, most of the industry does. Uh, there is a severe substrate uh, capacity constraint in the ecosystem um, over the last six months and projected to last through this year. So of course we have to be very smart in our design choices of how do we communicate uh, uh, and get the best out of uh, existing substrates. Uh, this capacity is probably is going to be short lived. Uh, obviously people are going to come up with ideas to improve capacity, but the, most of the industry is doing that. So, but I, I so I wouldn't really focus on um, architect. Is, we are not going to architect for a short term capacity constraint if that's that's helpful, Jan. I think the most important uh, is the package size and uh, the uh, number of layer counted as a challenge. And uh, as a future, if you take it like uh, 
five years from now, do you think this will be a obstacle neck to go in that direction? And we should shift out of this uh, to two and a half D uh, back again or other approach? Um, I, I know Gamal, you and I have talked about this in um, uh, our private meetings as well. Sure. But it's uh, it's not it's not a question of shifting. Uh, I, I, I've been pretty consistent in my views on this. It's really about how do we intelligently use organic substrates? How do we intelligently use 2.5D, wafer level finite or 3D? Uh, to connect different aspects of silicon. Uh, it's, I look at it as a pyramid, right? You have, let's say, a monolithic SOC, 3D constructions, 2.5D, and all the way down to what we interconnect on the board. None of this is going to be out of vogue. It's about how do we intelligently optimize uh, the different uh, parts of the pyramid, so to speak. Um, I'd like to invite Jose to see whether he has any questions, please. Jose is uh, chair for the co-design te technical working group. Okay, uh, Raj, I have a question um, as to whether you, you think that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning has a role as far as uh, helping in the, 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 the uh, optimizing the design flow. Oh, quite heavily. Uh, um, uh, AMD and other companies are using those tools heavily in terms of coming up with uh, the uh, interconnect interconnect architectures that actually have the best latency picojoules per bit and whatnot. Uh, absolutely, I think uh, different companies are different instantiations of those tools to be able to make it work seamlessly. But yes, the answer to your yeah. question. Is yes. Now, in that case, how 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 does one make the data available? Okay, can you elaborate more uh, when I say data available? To well, who, well, who, who, you to need who? a lot of data. There has to be a lot of um, data available in terms of. Uh, uh, it, 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 existing designs in mm -hmm. order to, to, to so, so in, in given the fact that IP is a major issue there. So I, I was wondering if it is, if, if the available of, availability of data could be a, a, a hurdle to making that possible. No, I, I think uh, in our interactions with our supply chain, we always have very tight collaborations with our supply chain. So that there's free flow of data either way. And uh, if there are, bottlenecks in terms of uh, server capacity and stuff like that, if that's what you're talking about. That's something we strive to improve on a regular basis. So that's just part of our regular business. Thank you. So I would like to, ste to uh, steer this question to Bobby. Bobby, would you like to answer the question that, uh, um, so, okay, Jose, would you ask Bobby the questions that you would like to ask him? My question was on, on, on using artificial intelligence or in, in machine learning to optimize these designs. What do you see? Uh, on right, yeah. Um, uh, I am unfortunately not smart enough to answer that question. Um, I can answer your other one though, which is like uh, the, the availability of data is actually a major pain point. Um, we, in a, uh, one of the things we discovered early on is uh, just trying to build a, uh, a package part from our three die, uh, you know, we ran into some silly barriers, like, you know, if there were three die into a package, you needed like, or four die in a package, you needed four times three, 12, 12 NDAs. Yeah, basically you needed like, you know, N number of NDAs for people to exchange information. So, and, you know, Raja just talked about the tight coordination with suppliers about information, et cetera, right? All of that doesn't flow naturally if you're trying to integrate chiplets from multiple vendors. And uh, so we are, we're at the point where everybody recognizes it as a problem. And we're trying to say, hey, here's, can we agree on data, the, techni the technical aspects of data interchange formats? And then we're trying to get consensus around the business aspects. How do you exchange information about um, your uh, uh, your heat map or your power distribution while still preserving your own uh, secret sauce? So I, I think I'm, in, I'm on the unfortunate position of saying, yeah, we recognize it's a problem, but we don't know what to do about it yet. So so I have a, a follow up questions. So um, we have thinking about design and. Uh, uh, so how do we look at layout? Because in, in a very true sense, um, design means 
layout is the first step. Layout on uh, um, on laminate, layout on interposer, or layout on fanout. So, what is the process of doing that very first step? Oh, was that a question to me, um, uh, Bill? Oh well, I was both, but why don't you? But I'll come yeah. to you first. I yeah. mean, layout is the responsibility of the architect. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. No, so the the uh, the key is um, uh, just again go back I go back to my pyramid or hierarchy in terms of what what we are connecting. If the memory uh, resides on a two point five interposer, if you're stacking CPU on CPU or CPU on uh, a different device, uh, the 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 layout view is going to be very different. Let's say we have to have a a TSC layout view, we have to have an interposer layout view, and then the rest of communication to the to the board will have a substrate layout view, right? And each has different tool sets to be able to uh, uh, do the interconnection. And then at some point, we have to make, uh, make it all come together for not just uh, design flow, but also uh, signaling flow, power, power analysis flow, and also sometimes work with our customers to understand what their board implications are to be able to deliver the, the whole SIPI design flow. So those are the different hierarchies that we have to work through with uh, are different ecosystem partners. So a substrate tool might be different from a silicon tool, right? For example, from a design tool standpoint. Yes. So because I was thinking that when you do that, you you need to involve thermal management, you need to involve warpage, you want to electrically good, and uh, um, all the all the various aspects that an architect need to worry about. Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, there is not, not a single tool that does all of it. So uh, we use, uh, obviously, the design flow is obviously the starting point in terms of what is the product need? What are, what are the two things that the simple, a simple example of, if I want to connect two triplets, what is really the product demand? So we start off with that as a, as a grounding basis for any architecture discussions. And then we are, from a package architect standpoint, it's his or her uh, responsibility to tell the design team saying, this is what does work. Hey, I want to connect this in a certain form factor. It doesn't work for watt for a certain part. It works for thermals. And then we get into the back and forth on what can I optimize on a die level, system level, package level to be able to get the desired outcome. And the answer to that question is completely dependent on the final system this product is getting used in. Um, uh, 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 a silicon package that I designed for a watch is going to be very different for what I designed for uh, a supercomputer, right? So it's a lot of a uh, lot of it is tribal knowledge as well. Thank you, Bobby. Would you like to comment on that one, please? Um, yeah. So it, it turns out you know we're lucky to have a bunch of really smart people participating, and one of the interesting challenges is you know you don't know who's going to use the interface, and you don't know what kind of designs is going into when it's an open interface. So. Um, the way we've tried to address it as a group is by sort of settling on taking a trick from the PCI world and choosing operating points for the interface. And then for those operating points, sort of laying out an expectation of the substrate, a physical expectation of the substrate and saying, okay, we, we think with, you know, based on sort of tribal knowledge as Raja just put it, we, we kind of say, oh yes, these operating points can be met in, in a laminate substrate in a uh, 2.5D substrate, et cetera. So the, uh, the short answer, or sort of the long answer is we're trying to help the product architects by um, setting expectations around what the performance of the interfaces, the operating point of the interfaces are, and around what the expectations of the substrates are. And one of the things we'd like to do with the, uh, with the POCs going forward is to sort of take out and say, okay, for these different substrates, here are the channel models and start sharing them publicly so designers can sort of glue all this together on their own and map them to their own designs. So either a reference design for an interpose or a channel models for the laminate substrate and along with uh, reference layouts, et cetera, which then the architect can sort of take into her own design and glue it together in any way she pleases for, uh, for just sort of map it to their own uh, needs. Okay, I have a question for Bhatvi. Uh, hi, Bhatvi. Can PIPE, P-I-P-E, help communicate between heterogeneous protocols 
such as uh, PCIe uh, chipset talking to uh, AXI chipset. Oh, right. I saw that. It's a good thought. So what, what pipe helps you do is make a random file to a random controller. It, but you, you, it, it doesn't do a protocol translation. If you want a PCIe transaction to talk to an AXI transaction, you need some kind of a PCIe AXI bridge in the middle. What, PCI, what, a, what a pipe interface does is it can take a PCIe controller from vendor A and mate it with a die to die file or a PCIe file from a completely independent vendor. That's the main advantage of a interface abstraction. You can sort of, because these tend to typically come from different, uh, uh, different designers in different houses, a, an abstraction layer helps you mate the two across, uh, across vendors. But if you want, uh, we, so you can use pipe to, trans, to transfer PCIe data over a die to die file, or you can use pipe to transfer AXI data over a, PC, uh, over a die to die file. But if you want PCIe transactions to be translated into AXI transactions, you need a logical bridge some kind of a protocol translator between the two. Hi, Thank you. Hi, Bobby. So, uh, so I have a question for Bobby. This is Kamal. Yes, sir. So, so Bobby, you know, uh, at which layer in the ODS do you see the addition of memory coherence uh, support? Memory coherence, we see it. I, I, in fact, the, the, the expert that's sitting right there, so I'm a bit embarrassed to answer this, but I'll, but it's a it's a transaction protocol. You know, at the end of the day, a memory coherence protocol is, is one more piece of data that's sort of being munched around on your on your network. So you 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 the the only catch is your memory your memory coherence protocol probably has some expectations around latency compared to say just bulk PCIe data transfer. Exactly. And so you have to accommodate that with like higher QoS in your network. I see. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Bapi. Yes, sir. Satadeep from UCLA. Uh, I had the question about the pipe thing. So, so uh, as you just said that uh, at a logical level, XC talks to XC and XC chiplet will talk to XC chiplet, but using this pipe transit pipe uh, adapter. The, the the question then comes is like, if I'm building a chiplet. Right. right. Which has some functionality and I want it to be out there in the ecosystem. I need to then know, I didn't then need to have like five different flavors of my chiplet because I don't know what that chiplet is going to be interfaced with. So I, I need, you know, a chiplet which talks to PCIe uh, or, or at the high level talks to PCIe uh, interfaces, uh, another chiplet with X, XC and so on and so forth. So do you think there is a scope where uh, you know, there's this universal transport layer that, that could help make any chiplet talk to really any other chiplet. And isn't that really necessary to make a chiplet world where any chiplet can talk to any other chiplet? Because if, if that is not there, then it seems like, you know, if, if I have to design my thing for XC, then I have only the XC subset of chiplets available to talk to. Right. Um, so it's a fair point whether there's room for a universal protocol, um, but it's also the flip side. Okay, let me give it. Yes, if there is a universal protocol, there's no doubt that building a marketplace becomes easier. Um, the catch is, I, I, it's, from what I've seen, designers are comfortable designing in the protocol and they understand because that protocol gives them some latency expectations, throughput, and performance power. It, it, it comes with a package. So at least in the intermediate stage, depending on what kind of systems you're building, system designers or chip designers seem to think in, in, in they, they seem to decompose their system. Uh, they would like to decompose, they seem to like to decompose their system into protocols they already understand because that gives them an expectation of what their system level performance will be, right? Um, so if you, you, if you sort of aim and say, look, we're giving you this universal protocol, then you, you have this adoption barrier for uh, a system designer to say, well, that's a brand new protocol. I don't know how it works when, you know, I, I need a, 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 X amount of simulation data. I need some performance analysis to find out whether your protocol actually works. Uh, you, because, you know, in addition, in addition to the protocol working, there's this enormous software infrastructure that's built up on top of these things. Right, but 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 okay. if that is just a that that is just put into an adapter, that that adapter itself can say, 
uh, you know, take in five different protocols and put it into one standardized protocol just for the data going between the chiplets. Yes. So is, that yes, the, sh the, sh the, the short answer to that is yes because you, so that's essentially the way we envision it is that we will have multiple transaction protocols uh, sharing the same physical die, but I I don't know if people have understood how to sort of munch them into one. So at any given moment, your chiplet will be a will there will be a PCI transaction or will they do an axi uh, axi protocol. Okay, so we have to uh, close this discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time. So I want to thank uh, Raja. I want to thank Bobby. And also want to thank all the audience, the participants. We really had a very good discussion.